Steve, it's really good to meet finally in person. Nice to meet you as well. Yeah, I've been looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, and you've you've appeared on John Vivaki's channel a few times. You're talking to a lot of the other people that we've hosted on Rebel Wisdom, and obviously your work really integrates very well with a lot of the conversations that have been happening. What? Why is that? What is it about your work that you think that integrates with with some of the the interests that many of our former guests have got? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um. um... You know, I feel like I feel like I've come into this this sphere. You know, some have called it the the liminal web space. Uh, you know, I've come into this sphere uh, sort of progressively over the course of the last couple of years. You know, I think I first heard about your channel. You know, probably two years ago, maybe watched some videos. You know, really really felt an affinity with the kind of questions you were asking, the approaches. You know. Um, I'm, you know, I'm also, you know, I count myself among the, the the population of integral refugees, you know, having studied and been deeply entrenched in that world for a while, and still having an appreciation for it, but also standing uh, a little bit a, a little bit critically towards it as well. Um, and I recognized that a lot of a lot of the conversation that's emerging is emerging exactly in that space. People who've been inspired by some of these big meta, meta theoretical um, you know, orientations, but who are also trying to wrestle with what's going on in the world in a, in a pragmatic way. And this is really key for me personally, is we can get meta-theoretical about all this stuff, um, which has its place and it has its value. But if it ends there, I, I say, what's the point? You know, we have to actually bring this to some sort of pragmatic, practical end and that's, of course, what I'm trying to do as, as a coach and as a coach trainer is to actually work with people in the context of their lives and help others to learn how to do the same thing, right? So that it all, all this big thinking, um, uh, uh, all this, uh, all of that comes down to something that is graspable even by people who don't have any inclination to, um, to be big thinkers or to go and study the, the, these meta theoretical orientations, right? So I, I think that there's some thread, you know, among um, your work and um, and all of the the people who are in this conversation um, that 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 I recognize as a thread that's central for me, right? And it's being informed by these these uh, these bigger orientations and deeper orientations uh, facing the world as it is, the the culture war, the difficulties, the the, the meta crisis, etc. And but trying to get to some sort of practical response, right? And uh, and so uh, that's why I've been excited to to build relationships and get into the conversation because I think that what we're doing in Alethea is uh, can contribute to that conversation because what we're doing is really on the practical end of it. And what I mostly see um, is the big meta theoretical end of it. Um, which is necessary, uh, but not as much on the practical end. Although I I feel the the urging, the the impulse in that direction for sure from everyone. Yeah, and since I've discovered your work and started training in it, what I find really interesting is that it's very much based in the kind of work that I've been doing before. People have talked about dialogos. Mm -hmm. John Viveki, obviously famous, he talks about dialogos, which is a conversation that can go somewhere new, and there's a sense of kind of unfolding. A natural, um, yeah, a natural unfolding to the conversation, and that's very much where your work is based. And it's been interesting doing it because I come from a, a, a background where I was trained in counselling dialogos, which was much more having a presence-based conversation to see what it emerges between the two people. Um, and I know that a lot of coaches are coming from a very different methodology where they're kind of like trying to make things happen effectively. Right. You go in with a goal, you set, you set objectives. And what I keep getting from your work is that it's, it's kind of a combination of, of, of both of them, but more oriented towards unfolding rather than, rather than kind of a coaching methodology that you learn and then apply in lots of different areas. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And one of the big distinctions, kind of anchoring distinction for me in, in my work is this distinction between self-improvement and self-unfoldment. And I think what you're pointing to is that is that largely speaking, the coaching industry, you know, from its inception, you know, and the coaching industry is now what may, we could say maybe 45 years old, approximately, 
it's really always been about self-improvement in a certain kind of way. And even when you uh, bring in a more developmentally oriented uh, you know, uh, kind of coaching, one that's founded upon adult developmental theory, that just becomes the new version of self-improvement. It's like I assess myself here, I want to get to the next level of development, that I you know, take as some kind of improvement to my life or something like that. And so even developmental work can get usurped and overtaken by that self-improvement agenda. But the thing that I noticed, and you know, I should say that I started as a self-improvement coach. You know, that was essentially what I was trying to do. Now, it was of a developmental flavor, but I now view that as self-improvement. And I would do those kinds of developmental assessments and try to help the client to develop, you know, create a, a plan for them to develop to the next level of development. Um, but what I noticed again and again and again was that when we start out with that need to improve, we're really starting out in a place where we feel some sense of self-deficiency. And in that self-deficiency, when we initiate a project from that, from that foundation, from that, that belief in being deficient, any bumpiness we experience along the road seems to reinforce that it's true we don't have what it takes. You know, I'm struggling with this. Oh, maybe I am really deficient. I am really lacking in that. And so, um, and even if you get to some sense of improvement, if you fulfill the goal, how long does that feeling of sufficiency really last? You know, it, it, for some people, it's literally minutes. Maybe it's hours, maybe it's days, maybe it's weeks, maybe it's months. Probably not years. I haven't seen that, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens is very quickly, people say, well, actually I did all this work and improved, but you know what? My life really hasn't worked out still. I must need another improvement. Mm -hmm. And so we get on this kind of self-improvement hamster wheel where we're just running, 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 running. And I've found myself in, the, in that kind of place and I've seen clients in that kind of place and it wears you down after a while. And so the whole, I, I try to flip this whole story on its head mm -hmm. and, and that that is to distinguish self-unfoldment as a possibility. And the provocative question that I ask is, what if nothing is missing? Now, I don't mean this in a kind of naive way, like, yeah, of course we can lack skill. There's a lot of things I can't do, right? But that doesn't mean that fundamentally as a human being that I'm deficient. It just means that, yeah, I can't fix my car and I can't play basketball very well. And that maybe there are certain things in term, you know, in, at, at my work I can't do it as well as I'd like to. And I can build those skills. But that has nothing to do with my value, my wholeness, my worth, my, uh, my completeness of being human, right? Well, what I find is when we start the conversation with that premise, what if nothing is missing? Very often clients will say, well, it kind of feels like something is missing. And so then I say, well, what's it feel like? And what we do is we go and we shift instead of from what's not here to what is here. And we focus the conversation on what is concretely here, palpably here. How are you feeling this deficiency? What does it feel like? What are the emotions surrounding it? And we start to work concretely with what's actually here in a way that what's here begins to unfold. And as it unfolds, we drop into deeper self-contact, um, uh, through the various depths that we work with in Aletheia. And that lands us into the direct experience of innate wholeness and completeness. And it, so this sense that we're deficient isn't actually because we're deficient. It's because there's a, there isn't a deep enough self-contact. You know, we're so busy in a self-improvement mode trying to get there. We have, we have forgotten to check what's here. And so we shift that whole orientation and that produces a very different kind of conversation that very often goes in a direction that's surprising for the client. And so I think, um, you know, without, without getting too technical about it, the kind of conversations that we do that are self-unfolding are a version of dialogos. You know, they're a flavor of, of that. Uh, they're a tapping into the logos in some sense, um, a, a concretely what's here and, um, and actually allowing that to unfold, but in the space of having what unfolds be uh, pragmatic in a person's life. You know, so we always start those conversations in a place that allows people to then circle back to their life and say, given what's unfolded, how am I going to show up at work? How am I going to show up in my relationship in a different way? And so it becomes uh, 
not a kind of abstract journey. It becomes a very tangible, relevant, useful, valuable unfolding. Can you talk about the journey that you went on to get to, to where you've ended up with the practice that you're now doing? Because you came from a much more sort of self-improvement background. Can you talk yeah. about that journey? Yeah. So I think my journey is, is very common in ter- you know, for, for coaches, for professional coaches, is that you know, I got trained um, in a, a year-long you know, certification program um, uh, back in uh, 2001, 2002. And upon graduating, I felt like I had some orientation in the field, but I also felt like a beginner. And I was. And so what do you do when you're a beginner? What do you do when you feel like you need to, you need to learn more? Well, you take more classes, right? So I took more certification programs, more trainings over the course of the next many years, you know, two, three, four, five, six years. I was taking new things every year, kind of in, you know, with a sensitivity to what I was bumping into with my coaching clients, where I was feeling limited and stuck and things like that. And, um, but after a while, what I then had was this kind of very eclectic, you know, uh, coaching practice. And I would do an intake with a client and I would think, hmm, well, maybe a little bit of this with that client, you know, maybe some internal uh, family systems with that client or some focusing or some somatic work or maybe some emotional work here or, you know, different kinds of things. And what I noticed was that it kind of worked, but it also kind of was confusing for me because it was sort of like I had so many options and it was a little bit, well, let's try this and see if it works and okay, let's experiment with this. And I feel like it was also a little bit confusing for clients. And essentially that kind of um, stirred some questions for me. And one of the questions, one of the realizations that I had first was that um, as I was looking at all these methods and really trying to say, well, which one do I want to choose? What I noticed was they all worked, except they were so different from each other. And uh, that initially surprised me because I thought human beings being what they are, probably everybody's got a variation on a theme. We're all kind of working in a, in a similar way with a very slight variation. But I wasn't finding that at all. There were like huge variations between these different approaches. And they all worked, except they also also failed to work. And I began wondering what explains that. Like, when you fail to work, meaning sometimes they work, sometimes they didn't? Yeah, exactly. So you, would, you might try um, you know, a, a little bit of... Uh, felt sense work with the client and the client just says, you know, I don't get what you mean. What, what do you mean? What does my body feel? Mm. Right. And it's like, well, there's a, there's a closed door. Like what option do I have now? So when you have an eclectic practice, fortunately you say, okay, that pathway is closed. Let's try something else. And I think that's pretty typical. You know, that's pretty typical about the way we would work. So, um, but it's also curious, like, could I, how could I know that, that wouldn't be a good question right now to ask the client. You know, how, and could I, could I help them to open that up? How might I do that, right? So th- those kinds of questions were stirring when I say that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I had an integrating insight. Um, I think it was probably around 2010 or so. And the insight was that all these methods work, but they work at different depths. And of course, that explains why they work and why they don't work. Because if the client is uh, orienting to their experience at a particular depth, and you meet them there with a methodology that specializes in that depth, it works really well. But if you try to meet them with a methodology that specializes at a different depth, then there's a mismatch. You know, and one of the, you know, one of the, the principles of, of coaching as, as well as psychotherapy is always meet the client where they are. Well, what if we start to understand where the client is in terms of depth? That brings a whole new sensitivity in terms of how to meet them. And it's not simply meeting them where they are. It's meeting them where they are uh, with a, a, a range of methodological moves that we can make. Um, that that uh, support them at that depth, that meet them at that depth, that help them explore and open up that depth. So um, when I had that insight, very very quickly thereafter, I realized that at least for me and and the way I could see it, there were four depths, and I could immediately see that the kinds of methods that I had been studying kind of filtered quite neatly into these four depths, 
and that became the kind of backbone view of depth that I uh, that I use in Aletheia coaching and teach. And um, initially, I felt like like probably we would work at the shallowest depth with clients, and after some months, we would they would graduate. We would graduate the conversation into a next deeper depth, and several months later, we would go deeper, and so on. But in fact, that's not how it worked. How it worked was that clients were navigating up and down these depths very dynamically in the span of a single coaching conversation. So it wasn't a matter of of flipping from one methodology to another. I had to actually create an integration of method that could fluidly and seamlessly flow between the depths. Uh, And that was happening in a in an orderly way, but in a way that was so complex as to not be predictable in a certain kind of way. Um, So we actually had to, you have to follow the client as much as you lead the client in this this, uh, way of coaching. Um, And that's really how the method began to unfold for me, was um, seeing that distinction of depth, seeing how the methodologies fit, um, recognizing we needed to have a more integrated sense of, of all of them, that can fluidly flow, and uh, that's what I teach these days. And what are the four depths? The four depths, the shallowest is the depth of parts. So when we experience reality at this depth, the core of that experience is the sense of separation. So you and I are separate. You're David, I'm Steve, right? Um, We're both separate from the chairs we're sitting on, separate from the room around us. That's the way we typically look at the world. We're almost always living at the depth of parts in that sense. We look at the world and we see these separations. But when we gaze inwardly at this depth, we also see separation. We see a mind separated from a body. We see body parts separated from each other. But we can also see parts of our ego structure. So ego structure is fragmentary. There's different segments of ego structure. And these are what we call parts. And so, you know, and we'll, we'll say this, all of us say this in our normal everyday language, you know, a part of me is really upset about what you did, right? A part of me feels this, a part of me feels that. And very often, multiple parts are activated at the same time, producing uh, a sense of, of um, sometimes confusion or, or, or contradiction even, you know, a kind of inner contradiction. A part of me really wants to leave this relationship, but a part of me really wants to stay, well, who am I going to listen to, right? So as coaches, we frequently meet people exactly in that kind of situation where they feel stuck. And when they're feeling stuck, they're feeling this inner divide, this inner fragmentation. And so when we meet someone there and we meet them with parts work, parts work is a very skillful way of working with all of those things to help to balance them and to make those parts more permeable to the rest of the, uh, of the depths. Um, the next depth down, when parts actually, when we work with them, they soften and melt. And as they soften and melt, they relax, and they and the client will just spontaneously drop into the depth of process. And when we experience reality from that depth, what we experience is a kind of fluid flow of felt experience. It's mostly an embodied experience. It's a it's a uh, it's a bodily felt sense but can also arise as uh, in the imaginal, um, imaginal felt imagery. And so uh, think of the kind of imagery that you experience in your dream life. Well, we can actually have that kind of imagery as a waking dream as well. So when we're dropped into this particular depth, there's a lot of working with what's arising in the body and working with, with images that are naturally occurring. And if we're attuned to this depth, and, and there are people who are more attuned to this depth than parts, they're living in that kind of world. You know, little children live in that kind of world. You know, they see imaginary friends and they have an easy time to play and to open up. And that's all an indicator of, of, of more consciously inhabiting this depth. But this depth is very practical because what we're actually feeling is a kind of deep relatedness that we have with between ourselves and, and everything. And so, um, when I'm working with executives and leadership coaching clients, I'm always working to get them access to the depth of process because it enables them to actually sense the kind of what's unfolding in the relationships. 
And you know, leadership and a lot of the work that they do is fundamentally relational. And so um, being able to sense what's unfolding is an important way of, uh, and really necessary way to be oriented. And the depth of process gives that as a capacity. And then if we follow this fluid flow, it's flowing somewhere. It's not random. It's flowing in a life-affirming direction. And I really credit uh, Jean Gendlin for pointing this out. This is who I learned it from. You know, Jean was uh, a kind of rock star of, of, of the depth of process. You know, his focusing methodology is, is all at the depth of process. And Jean was really talking about the ways that this was, that, that this is flowing in a life-affirming direction and towards the realization of who we are at our core. And so as we flow uh, with this uh, felt experience, we will um, come across openings to drop into the next depth down. And there are two kinds of openings. There are openings which I call portals of presence or portals of absence. And so the next depth down is the depth of presence and absence. And we can drop into a quality of presence or we can drop into a quality of absence. And uh, actually, it doesn't matter which we drop into because as we inhabit that depth and we fill it out um, and we explore it, what we realize is that presence and absence have a relationship that's really exactly like yin and yang in, in Taoist philosophy in the sense that they're really co-emergent uh, and co-defining of each other. And so we find this kind of rhythmical fluidity of um, flowing between different qualities of absence and presence. And this is really where, this is the depth that, that and this depth and the depth deeper are the depths that the essence work is really informing me with, right? My, uh, I spent 14 years in the Diamond Approach School and um, I left the school about uh, five, year, five or six years ago, but I've continued to, um, to study, studied a little bit in, in um, Faisal's branch of the school, the Diamond Logos, and, uh, and continue, uh, I'd say it's really the, the backbone of my own spiritual practice, even though I'm not an official student of, uh, of uh, the Ridwan School anymore. But the beauty here is that at this step, there's really a, an openness into differentiated qualities of presence. So here we have love and compassion and will and peacefulness and joy and bliss and you know confidence and courage and strength and and so many different virtues. These are deep human virtues. And when we land into this depth, the prevailing feeling is of wholeness and completeness. We feel like nothing is really missing. And so, and it's this that we're really, you know, this question: what if nothing is missing? That's really what this is, that question is pointing to. It's what if you could actually deepen in self-contact and land into the sense of wholeness instead of having wholeness be some future state on the end of, you know, several self-improvement projects, which is normally the way it's, it's, it's held. So, um, so landing into this depth of presence and absence um, gives an embodiment of these different qualities, and then they can be brought into life. They're unblocked. They can be spontaneously arising when needed and brought into life. And then the final depth is the depth of non-duality. And so we take the duality of presence and absence, and we have a way of working with that inside the methodology to actually drop from that depth into the depth of non-duality. And in fact, we have a variety of methods of doing non-dual work in, in, in Aletheia coaching. We have a kind of depth-wise method. We have a mind approach. We have a body approach. And we have a heart approach. And that winds up being a kind of non-dual curriculum that we teach in our more advanced classes um, to really explore that space in a variety of ways. And as strange as this might sound, there are actually many different flavors of non-dual states. And yet they're all non-dual. So we, uh, we then go and explore all of that. And so with all the work that you've done and all of the models that you've learned and what you're teaching now, how do you feel people develop in the, the most concise way possible? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think the development in, in the terms that I'm working with is, is, uh, shows up and is demonstrated by people inhabiting more of their, more of their depth. 
you know, and so development isn't an ab abandoning of, let's say, the depth of parts um, and a favoring and a trying to get to the depth of non-duality. That's just self-improvement in different clothing, right? So really the idea here is, is um, unfolding more and more of our innate wholeness. So that's really what unfolding is, is unfolding is always an unfolding of wholeness into a greater expression of wholeness. So at no point is there um, any sense of deficiency. You know, I look at like, um, you know, the, the plant world maybe as a simple analogy here. You know, sometimes I talk about the unfolding of an acorn into an oak tree. You know, if we look at this acorn, we don't look at it and we think, gosh, this is pathetic. This is such a deficient oak tree. It's got no roots and no branches and no leaves. And oh my gosh, it should just give up and go home, right? Instead, we look at it as a miracle. We, we look at this acorn and we think, this turns into an oak tree. Oh my gosh, that is amazing, right? And then the, how it does that is it does that through certain conditions. So when the conditions are right, that unfolding is a natural occurrence. And that unfolding is in a deep relationship with its environment, with the exact conditions uh, that are present there. And what I find is that's what we're trying to do in our, in, in our coaching conversations is create the conditions in which unfoldment uh, as a natural process of life actually spontaneously emerges in, um, in the conditions and the relationships that the person is in. And that, is, that can be viewed as a developmental uh, process that can be described in these developmental models. Um, academically, that's of interest, right? But pragmatically for, our, for you know, showing up in your relationship, not so much, right? But so it's, it's, this, it's this deepening um, conscious uh, embodiment and, in, and inhabitation of our own innate depth that actually develops us. And when you have an ontology of depth and a way of working at each depth skillfully so that the client spontaneously deepens, then, uh, then that unfoldment and that development is a natural outcome of that. And we're putting on a, a course, we're putting on a course with you in October this year. Um, what do you, what's the intention with that? What do you hope people will get from it? So the intention with that and, and what I hope people will get from it is, is uh, firstly, you know, uh, a way of feeling around and playing with this distinction between self-improvement and self-unfoldment to really not just understand this distinction in an intellectual way, but in a way that it that relates to what's actually happening in their life. And we'll be introducing, you know, particular ways of attuning to your experience, um, pragmatic practices, certain principles of unfoldment that you can actually implement in your life, that you can actually practice in real time. And there'll be opportunities to work in breakout rooms so you'll see how this works for other people and it will work differently for them. But learning that will help you recognize that how it's showing up for you in your uniqueness and your differences is also unfolding. Um, and we're going to um, do a kind of tour through these different depths, introducing the basic practices and the principles, not as a coaching methodology, but more just as a way of relating to your own lived experience. Um, and it will be, I think, uh, uh, a fun and eye-opening exploration of depth. Um, that I think will will open a lot of possibilities for people that um, that uh, that I, I suspect they'll want to continue to move move into, because as we deepen and as we unfold, there's a sense of of there's a, there's a fundamental life affirming sense that we begin to develop, um, and uh, and it's a I think John Verveke calls this a kind of you know a, a reciprocal opening that occurs you know as we are in unfolding conversations, whether it's between partners uh, in an unfolding conversation or between coach and a client, there's a kind of way that we're each opening the conversation, the relationship is opening, it's unfolding, and it's life-giving. So, uh, so that's what I'm, I'm hoping people get out of it. And what will it draw on? What kind of different methodologies or techniques or practices will it draw on? So, <clears throat> so at each of these depths, the depth of parts, process, presence and absence, and, and non-duality, we have methodology. And I call them parts work, process work, presence work, and non-dual work. And 
uh, I'll be introducing uh, elements of, uh, of these methods um, as practices that you can do in, in your solo life. And um, maybe it'd be helpful to also add here that the way that we practice parts work in Aletheia is inspired by in, uh, uh, internal family systems therapy uh, that was created by Dick Schwartz. Um, there's some modifications to that that we've had to do in order to integrate it into the depth ontology. Um, the kind of process work that we do is inspired by Gene Genlitz focusing. But once again, some modifications are needed to integrate it into a depth ontology and to integrate it with the other methods. And the kind of work that we do at the depth of presence and absence, with which I call presence work, is inspired by um, really something that Almas calls the theory of holes. Um, and it's really inspired by a way of working with absence and presence um, at that kind of depth. And, you know, we also have non-dual work, which we won't be getting into in the, in the program in October because we need a lot more space and context to be built before we do that. But that's very much inspired by the various non-dual traditions. And so, you know, I have a background um, not only in the diamond approach uh, at that depth, but also in Tibetan Buddhism, you know, um, and uh, but uh, also inspired by by all the different non-dual traditions. You know, Taoism has a a non-dual element, non-dual Christianity, uh, Sufism, etc. So in many ways, we're gathering together, you know, some of the, you know, the common threads of the world's wisdom traditions and integrating it in with it into this depth psychology that also brings those things into, into relationship with Western uh, understandings of, of ego psychology, right? So the methodology across these four depths and integrating it is really uh, an, an integrated uh, psychological and spiritual methodology. Um, and then, you know, we're expanding it. Um, we also have, a, a, you know, a, a method of working with group unfoldment, things like that. So we're expanding from there also into the social field, uh, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, I really like, since I've come across your work and been kind of dipping into it more and more, I like the bits that you've put together. I feel like you've got as far as I can tell from my experience of personal growth and my my, my personal um, journey, want of a better word, um, I feel like those parts or those particular ingredients are really necessary. And I also, the reason that I'm really looking forward to running the course with you in October is it feels like a very good thing to be doing as Rebel Wisdom starts to, to wrap up so people can kind of use some of these tools, learn some of these tools and make some kind of commitment it's sort of a purpose an, an, an unfolding um, process around sort of purpose and direction that I feel is a really good thing for people to tap into given that rebel wisdom will be ending in November yeah yeah you know it, it's my sense um, that the the transition that we're in you know working our way through the meta crisis is so mind-bogglingly complex that trying to take any approach that tries to assess the situation and design a plan through is sort of doomed to fail. It, it, we just can't grapple with with the complexity that uh, that 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 this is presenting us already uh, and I think it's only going to get more amplified as the years go on for a while but I do see that it's possible to to chart an, a, a pathway through this that is life-affirming, that allows us to uh, address the kind of basic concerns we have as human beings, that is an unfolding path. So in my view, a lot of uh, this kind of approach, which we could say is actually a primordial approach, this unfolding is where it all started from, right? This is a, this is a, um, a return, but also a an integration with the latest neuroscience and ego psychology and, and everything, uh, but it's it's a return to something that can get us through, and so this is this is what I'm excited to explore. And I think, of course, much more is needed. I don't think that this is any kind of you know complete solution in any kind of way, but I think it's pointing in a direction that can be explored in the context of of, of our personal lives, our our relationships, even our group life that can start to give us some way through. Um, it's not a linear way through. It's gonna be very non-linear. Uh, it's gonna jump around. It's gonna challenge us. Um, uh, 
but all of that can actually be worked through in an unfolding way. You know, in other words, we don't have to somehow be different than we are or be in another place in order for us to get through. What if everything that we need to get through this in some way is accessible or unfoldable from here, right? And I think that is that is really where I'm coming from in this, is that, you know, I, I, I remember, um, yeah, pro this is probably 20, 25 years ago, Pema Chodron, who, whom uh, many of us love, including myself, wrote a book, Start Where You Are, right? And I think that's, you know, that is, if there was a tagline for, for my work, it would probably be something like that, start where you are. There is something already here that is wondrous enough, magnificent enough um, uh, to be able to get us through, but we don't know it. And we don't know it because there's, there's this lack of deep self-contact. And there's so many things happening in the world, this accelerating pace, the digital technologies, everything is pulling us away from ourselves. Everything is fragmenting us. And so this is a way to begin to work with that fragmentary uh, self, uh, that even that is not in the way. Working with that is the way. We have to work through that exactly as it is, relating to, to exactly as that is showing up. And we can find our way back and forward through there. So I, th I think that is, um, that's right now one of the things that's really exciting me about this kind of work and, and why I'm trying to bring it to the world. Steve, great place to finish, very poetic. Thank you. Yeah, thanks David. I really enjoyed this conversation.